You know, I, I keep saying this again and again, very seldom do you have a prime minister of a country going up in parliament and publicly making such grave allegations against a foreign government. Now, five days on, we have not seen anything, we have not heard anything to, in terms of evidence to back up those claims. So, either of two things could be possible. Either they don't have that evidence or they don't want to release that evidence at this stage. Which do you think is most likely in this case? I think the, uh, there are two aspects to your question, uh, Zaka. One is, why hasn't it been done? I think the, the, the obvious uh, answer is that uh, Trudeau is in bed with the NDP. Uh, he uh, needs their support uh, and uh, he can't jettison it at a time when his own popularity in the opinion polls is plummeting. But I think, you know, uh, at a different level, there's also something about the nature of intelligence information and, and the, how it is shared. Uh, my own understanding is that mostly countries and agencies are much more comfortable sharing it with counterpart agencies from friendly countries rather than making these things public. Now, I understand the dichotomy. Why the hell did he make a public statement exactly. in parliament yep. Yep. Uh, if he wasn't in a position to share. Correct. But I'm just trying to put a nuance here that a lot of times uh, sensitive information picked up by intercepts, picked up by whatever methods, uh, you know, uh, whether through tech int or signals or whatever, isn't the kind of stuff that agencies put out in public, but they do uh, often share with friendly agencies. Okay. Uh, Pramit Pal Chaudhary, one other thing that Trudeau said, and he said this yesterday at the uh, press conference on the sidelines of the UNGA, that he raised this personally with Prime Minister Modi at the G20. Now, if indeed he has shared whatever evidence or whatever information the Canadian intelligence agencies have about Niger's killing and potential Indian involvement in it, then do you believe that Mr. Modi and his government have come to a conclusion that that evidence or whatever information has been shared with them is not good enough and that's perhaps why India has ratcheted up. I mean, India was the country that went ahead and said, okay, halt all visas for Canadians who want to travel here. Uh, do you think that would be a fair conclusion? Uh, you're on mute, Pramit. You'll have to unmute yourself, please. Sorry. All right, go um, ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, Zaka, your voice was a little... Uh, um, Difficult to understand there. Um, so I'll just say on the the, the question of the re, of the visa charge, the visa decision. Yeah. Uh, yes, there is. I would say a gentle escalation taking place uh, here. Uh, India wants to send a message to Canada, but it doesn't want to disrupt the relationship beyond a certain point. There are many things India could have done further. Uh, for example, on Indian students. Uh, going to Canada. I mean, the real problem for Indian students going to Canada is that the Canadian High Commission, even before the crisis, was taking five months to issue visas. Um, the but uh, and there's a lot of business relationship that's still taking place. Um, but I think the the the, uh, the game both sides are trying to do right now is send messages to each other uh, about the strength or the, the, the their concerns with each. But this is standard diplomatic position, and it's not an action. It's not an issue. But there's an additional reason I would argue India has has had to put a freeze on visas for the time being. There are uh, many, obviously, uh, tens of thousands of Indian Canadians, uh, a lot of them Sikhs, uh, who have um, PIO cards, uh, who are basically have a long-term visa and have almost free entry into India. Uh, there is a concern um, that some Khalistanis may use or try to exploit the present crisis. We saw a, Canadian, uh, a Congress politician was assassinated a few days ago and a Khalistani, um, a Khalistani uh, terrorist claimed responsibility. So uh, if I, my understanding is that they, those, a lot of those PIO cards will now be revoked or put under and a lot of Indians from Canada will now be put under a tight visa screening process, uh, partly because of their the concerns that there may be some. Back. All right. 
let me uh, let me also uh, as since Pramit mentioned this, uh, I think we have a graphic where we can show. Uh, look, Indo Canadians form a, a substantial minority in uh, in Canada. If you look at the number of Indian students, for example, uh, Canada is the second most favored destination after the United States. In fact, it is more favored for Indian students than even the UK, where with 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 whom we've had traditional uh, relations. Of course, some of the best universities are there in the UK. But despite that, look at the numbers. In 2018, there were a lack in 70,000 uh, students who, who went to Canada. In 2019, it was 2 lakh 18. It dipped a bit in the COVID years, uh, came down to a, a lakh 79. But just in the last couple of years, in 2022, it's gone up to over 300,000. Now that is a staggering figure because 300,000 we're talking about in a community of about a million, million and a half, uh, 300,000 are students. And of course, many of these students uh, have gone there uh, in the hope of getting employment opportunities uh, to finish their, uh, their course and then uh, get employment opportunities there. So these 300,000 students, they're a substantial number. And of course, because of this diplomatic fracas that's been going on, uh, their futures look a little uncertain. Now, uh, international students, their enrollment in uh, 2022, this is overall in Canada, 40%. And this is again a staggering number of all the international students who come to Canada for higher studies. 40%, 4 out of 10 are Indian, are coming from India. The remaining 60% come from different countries, mostly from China, some from Europe, uh, many from uh, Latin America and Africa of course. But 40% of all students who enroll in Canadian universities happen to be from India. So this is a, this is a huge economy. Now, many have asked the question as to why Canada is not reciprocating in the sense uh, India has put a halt on visas for Canadians who want to travel to, uh, to India. Why is Canada not doing the same, putting a halt on visas to, uh, Canadian, uh, to Indians, particularly students who want to go to that country? Let me ask Michael Rubin that. Do you see that possibility, Michael Rubin, that uh, Canada could impose, uh, because in diplomacy everything happens reciprocally, so Canada expelled a, a diplomat, India followed suit, there was an amendment to their travel advisory, India followed suit, but it's India that decided to halt the visas. Do you reckon Canada might do that or would that hurt their economy in a way that could be uh, debilitating, at least to the student economy? It's a great question. It would both hurt their economy, but the broader question is whether within the bureaucracy, Canadians agree with Justin Trudeau. If they believe that trust, Justin Trudeau went out on a limb, went out on a limb for very cynical and superficial reasons, and is leading Canada down the rabbit hole, you're going to have resistance within the Canadian foreign ministry about pursuing this to its natural conclusion of tit-for-tat uh, breaking of a much more important relationship. And this really is um, a tragedy on Canada's part. You know, Americans operate through the lens of analogies. And the analogies most Americans will process this through would be the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, the Saudi writer, former intelligence agent, and dissident in Turkey. When that happened, even though there was no love lost for President Recep Tayyip Erdogan of Turkey, the Turks provided evidence immediately. And that's what swayed public opinion. As you said in your introduction, either India, uh, either Canada doesn't have the intelligence, it's not as cut and dry, or um, they weren't prepared to release it. And at the same time, you know, this is really the, not the beginning of the story. This is the beginning of a new chapter because Canada has had a lot to answer for as being a hub of terror finance and as being a safe haven for some of these extremely militant, violent terrorist groups.